Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dean Reuter, Senior Vice President and General Counsel of the Federalist Society, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, thank you all for being here. You are, you are the stalwarts that show up at 9 a.m. In, in the morning after the annual dinner, so thank you for being here. I thought we had a, a great day yesterday capped by a great night last night, um, and I'm so happy that it seems that very few of you went to Union Station last night. So I count that as an additional success. I have been asked about last night's event, so I will tell you all at once uh, the official count. We had four justices of the Supreme Court in attendance last night, Justice Barrett, of course, uh, but also Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Alito. So the four justices were unable to issue any decisions, but they could have made a cert grant, so keep an eye out uh, for the orders list. Now, again, on logistics, uh, if, you're using C if you're getting CLE, use the QR code to sign in this morning. Make sure you do that. Also, don't miss the rare documents exhibit. I mentioned it yesterday uh, on the second floor um, and, and enter the drawing. I'm not, I'm not sure I was clear that there's a drawing. The item I held up yesterday is the door prize. Uh, it is a very handsomely framed page from a first edition Federalist Papers. Um, so it's, it's quite something to have. And you need to go to the South Carolina room to see the documents and to enter for that. And just to reassure you, they didn't destroy a first edition copy of the Federalist Papers. This was a, 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 an edition that was beat up. It was um, um, compromised in a lot of ways. So what they did was salvage some pages and made these. Uh, there's only four of them. So if you, you can get up there and see those documents and enter yourself to win. Um, we have another great day planned today, and uh, beginning with our panel discussion on precedent and originalism. But before uh, we get to that, I want to mention the day's events. We have five book signings that might not be clear uh, in the program later this morning, I think just after this panel, on the mezzanine level. If you haven't been to the mezzanine level, it's a nice, less crowded place you can go to. Uh, there's coffee up there. Uh, there's electricity up there. You can charge your phones and your laptops. Um, and then after a flurry of breakout panels all day long and another fireside chat and a special session on natural law, we're going to finish the day with Barry Weiss as she delivers the Olson Lecture. Now I'm honored to introduce the moderator of our showcase panel on precedent. Uh, Judge Pryor has served on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals for some 20 years now. In clerk years, that's 80 years. <laughs> Meaning, he's, meaning he has mentored, I've just coined that, that, that notion, but he, he has mentored and credentialed and brought along a clerk family of 80 men and women. Quite a legacy in and of itself. But before taking the bench, he served as Alabama's Attorney General, where, among other things, he founded and led RAGA, which has become a check on federal power and an enforcer of the rule of law. I could say much, much more about Bill Pryor, but I'll close with one note. Internally at the Federalist Society, when I'm trying to find a special speaker or a special guest or someone special to fill a slot, I think in terms of somebody who is of the Federalist Society, the inner, inner circle, a face or a name you think of or I think of when you think of the Federalist Society. And Judge Pryor is surely of the Federalist Society. He founded nearly every Alabama chapter of the Federalist Society, student or lawyer chapter. And he is so ingrained and integral to the organization, he's a part of the organization's DNA. So I'm very proud to welcome him today, Judge Pryor. Good morning. Thank you, Dean, uh, for that kind introduction. I, I thought that you had perhaps scheduled me to be the moderator um, this morning, uh, the morning after the dinner, because you wanted something a little rambunctious from me this year than in contrast with last year. <laughs> Our topic this morning is wither precedent. No one maintains that the Supreme Court has always and forever been originalist in its orientation. By any definition of originalism, there is a vast body of case law that does not conform to it. How do and should modern originalists, including inferior court judges who consider themselves originalists, handle this case law? 
Do non-originalist precedents count for nothing, no matter the expectation built upon them? If they count, how much do they count? In the light of the structure of the Constitution, does it make sense to be originalist in some respects, in some contexts, but not others? Does originalism itself provide means to answer or, or even address these questions, or does one necessarily have to step outside originalism to establish its relationship to precedent? To discuss these questions, the Federalist Society, as usual, has assembled a, a distinguished panel of scholars. I will introduce each of them in the order in which they will speak. Each of them will speak, give or less, around 10 minutes, maybe, maybe a, a, a little more. We have ample time uh, before we open it up. Um, our first speaker, Randy Kozel, is an associate dean and professor of law at the University of Notre Dame. There's been a Notre Dame takeover this week. <laughs> It's so quaint, you know, they, 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 they think they still play football there. <laughs> he also directs the Notre Dame program on constitutional structure. His book, Settled Versus Right, A Theory of Precedent, makes the case for using precedent to bridge interpretive disagreements. Professor Kozel received his JD magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, where he was the article committee chair of the Harvard Law Review. He served as a law clerk to Justice Anthony Kennedy on the Supreme Court and as a clerk to Judge Kaczynski on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Gary Lawson is the Philip S. Beck Professor of Law at Boston University School of Law and, importantly, the secretary of the Board of Directors of the Federal Society, one of its founders. He previously taught at Northwestern University Pritzker, Pritzker School of Law. Professor Lawson is a graduate of Claremont McKenna College and he received his JD from Yale Law School. He served as a law clerk to Justice Antonin Scalia, then Judge Antonin Scalia on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, and then later, as a law clerk for Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court. John McGinnis is a professor at Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law, where Professor Lawson previously taught. Professor McGinnis is a graduate of Harvard College and earned his JD from Harvard Law School, where he was an editor of the Harvard Law Review. He also has a Master of Arts degree from Bale College, Oxford, in philosophy and theology. Professor McGinnis served as a law clerk to Judge Ken Starr on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. And from 1987 to 1991, he served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice. He is the author of Accelerating Democracy, Transforming Government Through Technology, and Originalism and the Good Constitution with Mike Rappaport. He is a past winner of the Paul Bator Award given by the Federalist Society to an outstanding academic under the age of 40. Last but not least is, the, is Tara, Professor Tara Grove, the Vincent and Elkins Chair in Law at the University of Texas School of Law. I have to pay my respects. They do play football again. <laughs> <laughs> She graduated summa cum laude from Duke University, and she earned her JD magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, where she served at, as the Supreme Court Chair of the Harvard Law Review. Professor Grove clerked for Judge Emilio Garza on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, where I started my career, and then spent four years as an attorney for the Department of Justice, Civil Division, Appellate Staff. She is a co-author of Lowe and Jeffrey's Federal Courts and the Law of Federal State Relations, and she's served as the chair of the Federal Court Section of the Association of American Law Schools. She, too, 
previously receive the Paul Bator Award. <laughs> Dean Kozel. Thank you, Judge. Uh, let the record show I made it almost to 9.15 a.m. before I suffered the first insult of Notre Dame football today. Uh, but there is no doctrine of precedent in college football, so next year is a brand new year. Uh, I thank you all for being here. Uh, you know, at home in South Bend, I always teach on Friday mornings, in part because the people who opt in on Friday mornings are a special breed and such a dedicated lot. So thanks for being here today. Uh, this morning, I'll be arguing that originalism goes hand in hand with deference to precedent and the doctrine of stare decisis. Uh, even more than that, I'll argue that stare decisis strengthens the case for originalism by promoting ideals of stability and personality and constraint within an originalist framework. And I'm also going to argue that we ought to be skeptical of any account of originalism that squeezes out stare decisis, not only because of the potential for disruption, but also due to the long line of justices and constitutional thinkers who have described precedent as a legitimate and valuable part of the judicial process. Since I'll be talking about the virtues of precedent, I suppose it's only fitting that I'm going to start by looking backward uh, to October 24th, 1989. On that day, Case Western Reserve University hosted a distinguished lecture, and the speaker was Justice Scalia. He took aim at a variety of legal cliches. Too often, the justice explained, the wisdom of legal aphorisms can't keep pace with their prominence. Most relevant to the topic of today's panel, Justice Scalia challenged Ralph Waldo Emerson's famous line, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. Uh, Justice Scalia didn't criticize Emerson per se, uh, as the justice put it, I think it generally sound policy to leave poets alone if they leave you alone. Uh, <laughs> but his objection was to Emerson's attack on consistency, because as Justice Scalia noted, consistency is an ideal that resides at the core of both law and logic. In the legal world, consistency is made manifest through the doctrine of stare decisis. Stare decisis is equal parts legal rule and judicial mindset. At the most basic level, it urges judges to let things remain settled instead of constantly rewriting the rules and rehashing the past. We're here today to talk about originalism and particularly the weekend's broader theme of originalism on the ground. So the big question is whether originalism has room for stare decisis. And I think the answer is yes, the two are compatible. More than compatible, actually, because stare decisis dramatically improves the case for originalism on the ground. That's the point Justice Scalia made when he laid out his originalist philosophy in a matter of interpretation. He described stare decisis as crucial to prevent originalism from being so disruptive of the established state of things that it loses much of its utility. To my mind, the justice had it right about the role of precedent. And it's not just about making originalism palatable. It's about making originalism functional. So I start from the premise that in a democratic system that protects basic liberties and promotes human flourishing, in other words, in a country like the US, any legal theory that would lead to massive upheaval has a big problem on its hands. But that's just my inclination. That doesn't have analytical bite. The legal case for stare decisis begins with history and the fact that precedent-based decision-making was a familiar part of the case-deciding function as the founding generation knew it. Consider Madison's recognition that the good of society requires that the rules of conduct should be certain and known. That wouldn't be the case, Madison observed, if any judge disregarding the decision of his predecessors should vary the rule of law according to his individual interpretations of it. Or consider Federal 78, where Hamilton emphasized that judges should be bound down by strict rules and precedents in order to fend off what he called an arbitrary discretion. Federal 78 was among the sources Justice Kavanaugh cited three years ago to support his claim that the framers understood the doctrine of stare decisis as part of the judicial power rooted in Article III, giving it a firm constitutional basis. Even apart from that sort of textual argument, it strikes me as a solid inference that federal judges, including Supreme Court justices, may lawfully defer to precedent as a way of bringing stability, continuity, and coherence to the interpretation of a charter that's specific and exact in some ways, but open to debate in many others. Of course, there's no fully defined doctrine of stare decisis hiding in the Constitution any more than there's a treasure map in the back of the Declaration of Independence. 
Instead, the Constitution permits federal judges to create and apply and debate about the law of precedent, which is what they've been doing for years and what they continue to do today. Now, there's a notable counterpoint to this understanding. It comes from Justice Thomas's 2019 concurrence in a case called Gamble versus United States. Drawing on scholarly work, including a brilliant and way ahead of its time article by my co-panelist Gary Lawson, uh, Justice Thomas describes stare decisis as intention with the superiority of the Constitution over other sources of law. He argued that the judicial power doesn't authorize a Supreme Court justice to elevate mistaken precedents over the Constitution itself. Rather, the Supreme Court is constitutionally forbidden from deferring to precedents that are, as Justice Thomas put it, demonstrably erroneous. For him, stare decisis is lawful only in one set of circumstances, when the traditional tools of legal interpretation reveal that precedent, while incorrect, nevertheless adopted a textually permissible interpretation. The sweep of this position depends on how we define its key terms. The most salient question is what it means for a precedent to be demonstrably erroneous as opposed to textually permissible but still wrong. We need to know what confidence level equates to demonstrable error, and we need to know why when that confidence level isn't met, it's okay for the judge to defer to precedent instead of offering his best interpretation of the law irrespective of what prior courts have said. So we've got some work to do before we can put it all into practice. There's another step too because the concept of demonstrable error doesn't exist in a vacuum. According to Justice Thomas, courts need to assess whether an error is demonstrable using the quote, traditional tools of legal interpretation. That, I submit, is the whole ballgame. Because if traditional tools of legal interpretation is another way of saying originalism, which certainly seems to be the case based on the concurrence in Gamble versus United States, then every non-originalist precedent that reaches a non-originalist result is guilty of demonstrable error. Which means every non-originalist precedent that reaches a non-originalist result not only may be overruled, but must be overruled no matter how deeply it's entrenched and no matter how much reliance it's commanded. It might well be that an unbroken pattern of originalist interpretation going back to the founding would have been the best of all possible worlds. But in our actual constitutional system, where non-originalist precedents play leading roles in shaping the freedom of speech, the rules of criminal procedure, the extent of federal power and beyond, we need to worry about disruption and instability if all those precedents are up for grabs. Plus, as I've suggested, I think Justice Thomas's structural argument for the unlawfulness of stare decisis ultimately has too much going against it. Here's why. When we put together the history of precedent-based decision-making, the familiarity of the founding generation with that practice, prominent founders' depictions of precedent as part of the judicial process, the fact that from the moment of its ratification, the Constitution contained a host of uncertainties that would need to be worked out and solidified through processes including judicial interpretation, and the absence of any language indicating that the Constitution takes the unusual step of excluding stare decisis from the judicial power or the case deciding function, I can't help but to conclude that stare decisis has a role to play. I take heart in the fact that the Supreme Court sees it that way too. Over the years, justices who tend to interpret the Constitution very differently from one another have found common ground in the legitimacy of stare decisis. That remains true up to the present. Even in a landmark case like Dobbs, the majority describes stare decisis not just as constitutionally legitimate, but as promoting the consistency and integrity of what judges do. The idea that over the years so many justices have been wrong about the lawfulness of stare decisis is an aggressive claim. The bar for proving that case ought to be awfully high, and I just don't think the text and structure of the Constitution get us there. Now, accepting stare decisis doesn't mean freezing every constitutional mistake for eternity. That's where the doctrine does its essential work, in separating the mistakes we can live with from the mistakes we can't. Just as generations of judges have recognized the lawfulness of stare decisis, those same judges have acknowledged the validity of departing from precedent under certain circumstances. The essential step is making sure judges don't flex their overruling muscles every time they come upon a dubious opinion, particularly if dubious refers to all opinions that reflect methodological commitments different from one's own. So what should judges, including originalist judges, look at when deciding whether to revisit precedent? 
Uh, for starters, they should ask whether the external world has changed in a way that undermines the precedent's factual predicates. Likewise, they should ask whether the precedent's rule of decision has been procedurally unworkable. And reliance interests are significant as well. Apart from those sorts of considerations, the best reason to revisit a precedent isn't its interpretive methodology, but its substantive impact. Its impact on the ground, we might say. There's a corollary. If a precedent's real world effects aren't too bad, there's much less need to reconsider it, even if you think it's likely wrong, and even if its reasoning is decidedly non-originalist. The point here is that originalist judges, like all judges, need to be careful about how many errors they characterize as so grave as to demand overruling, which means it can't be the case that every non-originalist precedent is exceptionally harmful. And the same goes for a non-originalist court in its handling of originalist precedents. If I may, I'd like to return to Justice Scalia one last time before I close. One should assuredly not, Justice Scalia observed, shrink from changing his views when persuaded that they are wrong. The problem, he pointed out, is with the judge who finds himself repeatedly in that situation. In my view, what is true of judges as individuals is equally true of courts as institutions. There's nothing at all objectionable about a court that reconsiders its prior decisions from time to time. But those departures should occur within a stable legal framework and one that recognizes the court as an enduring institution committed to durable principles that transcend the current moment. Thank you. Hi, as, uh, as Randy just said about 30 years ago, I had a really crazy thought. <laughs> what if we take the argument for judicial review and we substitute judicial decisions for statutes in the form of the argument. Does that mean courts always have to prefer the Constitution to prior decisions the way they have to prefer it to statutes? Does that mean precedent is therefore categorically unconstitutional? That's just nuts, I thought. The problem is I couldn't figure out why it was nuts. So this was a time when I was pretty heavily involved in designing Federalist Society conference programs so I put myself on a program. Uh, I structured a panel uh, around me. And, uh, this is true. And I picked out, picked out the three people in the country who I thought would have the best chance of explaining to me while I was wrong. One of them actually is with us this weekend, might even be in the audience here. And to my, oh, there he is. And to my amazement, all of them said yes. And it was a phenomenal panel. It was everything I could have hoped for, except that at the end of it, I still couldn't figure out why it was nuts. So three decades later, still crazy after all these years. Oh, still crazy after all these years. How did I end up in this state? Well, let's go back to the case for judicial review. Uh, both houses of Congress pass a bill, goes to the president, president signs it. Uh, it's now a law. Uh, Article 1, Section 7, Clause 2 specifically defines it as a law. Can't, can't get any more law than that. And let's just suppose that that statute, that constitutionally defined law, pretty conclusively resolves a dispute between parties. And one of the parties who's going to win takes it into court. What's the court supposed to do? The court's job is to decide cases according to governing law. The party says, here's the governing law. Constitution defines it as a law. Give me my, give me my, give me my verdict. Uh, and the other side says, well, wait, wait, not so fast. Uh, that Article 1, Section 7, Clause 2 statute is unconstitutional. Well, now what? I mean, the statute is law. The Constitution has specifically defined it as law. More than that, uh, the statute is a, is, is a precedent. It's actually, it's multiple precedents because prior constitutional interpreters, at least three, the House, the Senate, and the President, have all independently determined that that is in fact constitutional. Uh, they are charged by oath and by implication from their grants of powers with making constitutional judgments. So we have not one precedent, uh, but three. Uh, does that combination of law plus precedent mean you have to give effect to the statute? Well, as we all know, uh, the answer to this come down to us is, is no, not necessarily. And, 
and while Marbury versus Madison is wrong about a lot of things, um, it's not wrong about this, and, 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 and here is why. Because not only is that statute defined as law, uh, the Constitution also defines itself uh, as law, uh, along with statutes and treaties, even defines itself as uh, supreme law over other competing sources like state constitutions and statutes. And then there's the inferential move of Marbury, which I think is correct, that even within that group of supreme law sources, there's something special about the Constitution. It is hierarchically superior to other claimed sources of law, statutes, treaties, the law of nations, also mentioned in the Constitution, common law, state constitutions, statutes. The Constitution just is the trump card, the ace of trumps, right? Um, well, wait a minute, maybe what we can say is that the uh, Article I, Section 7, Clause 2 status of that statute at least creates a presumption in favor of its constitutionality, some kind of legal force, not necessarily conclusive, but still non-zero. Uh, and there's a very venerable tradition of this, um, expressed perhaps most clearly by James Bradley Thayer in his Rule of Clear Mistake, Today we know it, uh, several other names, the presumption of constitutionality, or uh, to older generations, judicial restraint. But here's the thing, I don't think you can get that rule out of the Constitution itself. And in fact, when Thayer, a century ago, came up with this, uh, he came up with it not out of interpreting the Constitution, but out of anti-constitutional reasoning. His problem was that uh, courts were behaving too much like lawyers and like deciding things. And yeah, if you actually behave like a lawyer, you're gonna, you're gonna reach these conclusions that these things are unconstitutional. No, courts are supposed to be statesmen. Uh, I, I don't think that's true. I don't think Article Three uh, is a statesman article. I think it's a law article. So. I'm not sure you can get that presumption of constitutionality uh, out of Article III. Um, wouldn't it make the job of judges easier if they could defer to some extent to the prior decisions of Congresses and presidents? Well, of course it would. This is why deference doctrines get created by courts all the time. Uh, the problem, again, is uh, courts swear an oath to uphold the Constitution, not an oath to make their jobs easier. So I don't think you can get that out of there either. And finally, uh, fourth, might not those prior decisions be good evidence of the right answer, right? Something that a court should at least take account of because, well, maybe somebody else knows more than you do. And finally here, we have, of course, absolutely, 100%. I don't know that that is something that deserves the label of precedent because what that means is courts are supposed to figure out the right answer and sometimes good evidence of the right answer is what somebody else has come up with as the answer. Now, is there any good systematic reason to think that Congresses and presidents are, over the large course of things, likely to get the Constitution right? I mean, suppose one could try to make an argument for that, but it seems, like seems like a hard case to make. All right, so all of that's just about judicial review. What does that, any of that have to do with this panel? Well, now let's go back to my problem from three decades ago. Let's take exactly the same argument, literally, whole structure, and just everywhere where I had Article I, Section 7, Clause 2 statute, take that out and put in judicial decision, or if you prefer, press release by 26-year-old Ivy League law clerk. Okay. Um, what changes if we do this? Well, I think two things change. One is, unlike Article I, Section 7, Clause 2 statutes, the Constitution doesn't specifically define judicial decisions as law. Uh, nonetheless, I, I do think they qualify. Uh, uh, after all, Article 3 is not the judicial rambling clause, it's the judicial power clause. And for judges to have power, there has to be some kind of legal effect to the things that they do. So I think that is sufficient to establish that judicial decisions properly issued do have a status of law. Uh, presidents can execute them using the executive power. They certainly couldn't do that if they weren't law of sorts. So I do think we can get, uh, get rid of that distinction. The, the other distinction, and, and, and Randy mentioned this, um, is that Article Three does speak of this thing called the judicial power. Could it be that part of the judicial power just is 
the ability to prefer prior decisions of courts uh, to the Constitution. I mean, there, there isn't anything conceptually impossible about that. The Constitution is certainly capable of saying, um, oh, by the way, ignore me in these circumstances. It's not, it's not impossible. The question is whether it does so. And that's the problem I've had for three decades. I just can't read those words, the judicial power in Article Three, as authorizing courts to treat their own decisions better than they treat state constitutions, state statutes, Article One, Section 7, Clause 2 statutes, the law of nations, and every other source of law that there is. And I want to be very clear, I'm not saying judicial decisions are not law. They're absolutely law of sorts. The question is whether they are law that is hierarchically superior to the law of the Constitution, and that's a tough sell, right? So, um, does that mean all prior judicial decisions are of the same status as law review articles, op-eds, other things that might be of some interest as evidence of the right answer uh, to constitutional questions? Well, it's a, it's a little more complicated than that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give four qualifications to the, what I call the prima facie case against the constitutionality of, of the use of precedent. And they're important qualifications. Uh, Randy uh, uh, touched on a couple of them. Uh, one is, well, of, of course it's possible, uh, not only possible, but indeed, I believe, mandatory, uh, to pay attention uh, to prior decisions to see if maybe they do in fact constitute good evidence of the right answer. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. The mere fact that it's a judicial decision doesn't tell you anything, but if it's a judicial decision written by really, really smart people uh, who are using a method that you can count on as more or less reliable, uh, yeah, then there's a decent chance that maybe they've come up with something that you haven't. So all judicial decisions are not created equal. Uh, Clarence Thomas and Antonin Scalia are not. Harry Blackman and Earl Warren, they're just not. They're not the same things. One is likely to be, all things considered, better evidence of the, of the right answer uh, than others simply because they're asking different questions. Right? One, one, one set's asking more or less the right questions and what. So it's entirely possible to use uh, precedence for what I call epistemological purposes. What does it tell you about what's the right answer? Second, there actually are some contexts where the seeming sweep of the Lawsonian craziness uh, does actually run into a wall. There are times when I think you actually can get out of judicial power certain circumstances where, you know, those opinions do have some measure of legal force even against your best constitutional judgment. Uh, it, in order for them to be exercises of the judicial power, they at least have to be binding on the parties uh, to some extent. They have to be binding on the executive for enforcement to some extent, otherwise it's an advisory opinion. Uh, so you can get things like law of the case, you can get res judicata, you can get any number of things that are specific to the judgment, right, that do seem to have that kind of power. More controversially, uh, you might even be able to get a doctrine that says uh, uh, Judge Pryor does have to suck it up and follow Earl Warren and Harry Blackman. Why? Because he is inferior to them, right? The Constitution says so. And if you try to parse what it means uh, to be an inferior to person in the context of the Constitution, uh, this would be a whole nother panel, a whole nother talk. There's a pretty good case that it means you've got you've to follow what they say even if you are quite sure that they're wrong. All of which leads to number three, and this is, this is one of the most important points that Randy meant. How sure, right? Uh, anytime you're making a judgment about what the law means, whether it's a statute, the Constitution, or anything else, you're implicitly adopting uh, what I would call a, a standard of proof. You, you, you have to have in mind, how confident do I need to be in this answer before I can say it's right? Sort of, yeah, okay, seems okay, or I'm really confident, or I'm sure beyond a reasonable doubt. 
Uh, the Constitution itself doesn't seem to answer that question. Is there an argument that the existence of precedents, and, and here we can, we can get into mechanics, does it have to be a long line of precedents? Does it have to be precedents from judges who you think are applying the right methods and so forth? But what, whatever universe you, you narrow down, is there a case for saying those precedents at least raise the confidence level that you need to have before you actually declare that there's a conflict between those prior decisions and the Constitution. Because after all, the loss and problem only arises. The president says X and the Constitution says Y. How do you determine that the presidents say X and how do you determine that the Constitution says Y? Uh, I mean, that, that's, that's actually a very, very serious question to which, as I say, I don't think the Constitution provides a textualist answer. So there may be a ground on which Randy and I can join forces, right, uh, around that kind of problem of proof. Uh, and then finally, fourth, and, and, and then I'll, 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 I'll shut up for a while, um, everything I've just said is just about what I think the Constitution means, right? Most people in this room aren't actually interested in what the Constitution means. I, I, I'm guessing that. What you're interested in is how government officials are likely to behave and should behave. And it's a natural assumption to think that if you know what the Constitution means, well, that tells you how government officials are supposed to behave. And over a large range, that's, that's probably a reasonable assumption. Um, it's not an inevitable one, right? Um, notice what some of the considerations that, that, that Randy was invoking were consistency, stability, prosperity, things that make a society function. What if the Constitution is a botched job, right? To what extent do you at some point say, well, okay, we'll take it this far, but we, we actually have a society to run. I'm actually not commenting on that. It may very well be that the practice of precedent offers all sorts of positive advantages uh, that some people might think uh, are, are more important uh, than the meaning of the Constitution. I'm not, I'm not here to argue that one way or the other. I'm just, just reading the thing and, and trying to figure out uh, what I think it means. And, and I do think it creates, I mean, Randy says high burden. I, I think there is a prima facie case against the use of precedent, uh, at least at the horizontal level in, in constitutional cases. And at that point, I think the burden shifts to, uh, to others to come up with reasons why in this particular circumstance, either the constitution instructs us to ignore itself or we choose to ignore it instead. And that's, that's still where I am. Sorry. Uh, so uh, originalism, I think, may now be the leading jurisprudence on the Supreme Court. Uh, yet the court's many important, but I fear plainly non-originalist precedents, create a dilemma. If the court overrules those precedents, it will in some cases impose enormous costs on those who relied on the statutes and rights that were believed to be constitutional. But if it leads them as good law, constitutional law will remain partially, perhaps only marginally, originalist. Thus, I think... The central question, in some sense, for what I would call second-generation originalists, when originalism, unlike when I went to law school, has become a real thing, is the question of precedent and originalism. The originalist justices themselves are now debating the appropriate rules for overturning precedent. Justice Brett Kavanaugh has proposed a three-part test that would likely entrench much non-originalist precedent, because it requires, quote, special reasons for overruling cases. Justice Clarence Thomas, in contrast, as we've heard, would overrule any precedent, precedent that is demonstrably erroneous under original meaning, but doing so would overrule some precedents that are indeed demonstrably erroneous, but on which much of modern government is built. Uh, threatening chaos and upsetting settled expectations. Uh, I don't think any court's likely to adopt his proposal. So in this talk, I want to propose two ways that Mike Rappaport and I propose to solve this dilemma of restoring originalism while protecting settled expectations and thus promote originalism on the ground. 
The first is perspective overruling. Perspective overruling is a practice by which the court would apply its ruling retroactively to past statutes and actions, uh, but only prospectively to future ones. The advantage of perspective overruling is that it allows the justices to respect past reliance where necessary, while nevertheless moving the law decisively to the original meaning. Precedent rules should mistake, protect mistaken precedents when overturning them would, protect, would impose enormous costs on society, but prospective overruling would allow the court to apply mistaken precedent to the past, uh, thus avoiding the imposition of such costs, but still applying the original meaning for the future. This kind of overruling avoids the problem of entrenching mistaken precedent because the court needs no special reason for overruling it, as Justice Kavanaugh demands, but it also avoids the chaos of immediate overruling that Justice Thomas would cause. As an example, let's assume that the original meaning requires a much stricter non-delegation doctrine. Prospective overruling would allow the court to avoid upending the existing regulatory regime and thereby creating chaos. Agencies could continue to enforce their regulations in place, even if the statutes under which they have been promulgated violated the original meaning. Instead, the original meaning would apply only to future statutes, giving Congress time to pass uh, tighter regulatory laws as needed and perhaps create new institutional procedures designed to streamline passage. The most significant obstacle to our proposal is the fact that many originalists have never been comfortable with prospective overruling, just as Antonin Scalia, for instance, was an outspoken opponent. Scalia's argument arose in the aftermath of the Warren Court, which itself used prospective overruling when it overruled precedents on the basis of living constitutionalism. Scalia, of course, believed that many of those decisions violated the meaning of the Constitution, and we agree with him. Scalia, thus not surprisingly, argued against prospective overruling on the ground that it facilitated judicial activism, but that's a policy argument, not an originalist argument. Moreover, today, prospective overruling should help the court return to, its, to original meaning. It will foster fidelity to the Constitution. Now, Scalia's most important legal argument is that prospective overruling is beyond the judicial power of Article III because judges must base their rulings on what the law is, not what it will be. But I think this stance creates a problem for Scalia, precisely because he was an originalist, and as uh, Randy uh, has pointed out, uh, he also respected precedent. After all, the original meaning was the law. What allows him to follow precedent contrary to the original meaning? The justification must be that precedent rules too are the law and that they permit judges to retain precedent in some circumstances, even if contrary to the original meaning. I think that's right. Precedent rules were well-established common law rules that English courts, colonial courts, and federal courts in the early republic applied. And they applied it uh, even in cases of written law when they thought the uh, previous decisions were demonstrably erroneous. Scalia appears to accept the constitutional legitimacy of such rules, but if precedent rules are the law, then a judge may follow a precedent rule that permits prospective over overruling. Scalia appears to argue that at the time of the framing, justices did not engage in prospective overruling. And that, to my knowledge, is true, but there's no reason to expect that there would have been prospective overruling in the early republic. There were very few precedents, if any, to overrule, both because the Constitution was new and because not, at that time not just one decision, but only a series of decisions were required to create precedential force. Moreover, the judges were more likely to have shared the values of those who wrote the Constitution, making non-originalist precedents much less likely than they are today. Thus, the absence of prospective overruling at the time of the Constitution does not suggest that uh, common law rules should reject it under the circumstances of today. Courts can apply a new common law rule to new circumstances. In the case of prospective overruling, two new circumstances justify the practice. 
One circumstance is that the Supreme Court and the law more generally now places a high value on the Constitution's original meaning. We can discuss why it does. I think one of the more important reasons it does is we think that a continental consensus on what the constitu creating the Constitution is likely to be a lot better uh, than a 5-4 majority of judges, uh, justices who live in the most artificial uh, place in the United States, Washington, D.C. A second circumstance is that there are now so many non-originalist precedents on the books. We're 200 years in. Together, these circumstances support a rule for perspective over ruling. Now, let me be clear. In some cases, the normal processes of overruling in which justices invalidate past statutes remains entirely appropriate. For instance, if independent agencies are unconstitutional, the court should overrule prior precedent upholding them and declare them unconstitutional today. There are few reliance interests in independent agencies. Indeed, I think no one outside the Beltway would notice if they disappeared. We would also recommend another method of reconciling precedent with originalism, what we call cutting back. Under cutting back, the court would partially overrule a non-originalist precedent by narrowing the scope of non-originalist holding. The, narrow, the narrowing would not fully return the law to its original meaning, but would move it closer to the original meaning. Like respective overruling, cutting back also helps protect reliance interests while permitting a closer approximation of the Constitution's original meaning. Even if replacing a non-originalist precedent with original meaning would impose enormous costs, sometimes the court can cut back the non-originalist precedent to move the law closer, but not all the way to the original meaning without generating those costs. Consider the Commerce Clause to show how this would work. The court could overrule precedents that give Congress broad authority under the Commerce Clause to regulate non-economic matters, even if these matters had economic effects. This partial overruling would be somewhat similar to the court's action in the United States versus Lopez, but we both broader and more persuasive. Under this overruling, the court would define economic matters to exclude activities that did not involve a sale on the market, such as the actions at issue in Wickard v. Filborn or Gonzales v. Raich. Such a decision would be unlikely to create enormous costs, Overruling the precedents that permitted regulation of non-economic matters would cut back on the scope of the Commerce Clause under modern doctrine, although it would not return the clause to what many originalists believe it's, uh, was its original meaning. It would move us, though, decisively back towards that meaning. Our originalist approach to prospective overruling and cutting back has the advantage of creating a gradual, rule-based mechanism for returning to the original meaning. It would make it more likely that the court would restore the original meaning of constitutional provisions while recognizing, in a kind of Burkean sense, that a society comes to rely organically on non-originalist precedent. Perspective overruling would also promote the constitutional amendment process. Where non-originalist precedents have come to be accepted, and I'm sure there have been some accepted by the nation, perspective overruling would give time for social movements to arise to enact the principles underlying those precedents that are now widely supported. They could be enacted into the Constitution and thus perspective overruling would energize the people themselves to become once again the creators of our fundamental law. I think it's only through facilitating the Article 5 process that I think I fear has fallen into disuse that we can fulfill a basic premise of the Constitution. And that is that in the United States, it's we the people who rule, not we the judges. Uh, all right, thanks so much. I'm, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Uh, we, so far we've been talking about horizontal precedent primarily, that is the, the extent to which the Supreme Court can and should adhere to its own precedents. I want, to I want to talk about something that Professor Lawson briefly touched on, and that is vertical precedent. That is whether lower federal court judges have to obey Supreme Court precedent. Um, and I think there's a very strong argument that vertical precedent is not only constitutionally permissible, but is constitutionally required 
including on originalist grounds. And I actually think Gary Lawson will agree with me on this. Um, so what's the argument and what does it mean? The basic argument comes from Article 3. Article 3 says that the ju judicial power shall extend to one Supreme Court and such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 9 also refers to inferior tribunals. What the US Constitution does is establish that some court, one court is supreme and the other courts are inferior. And many scholars have looked at this text as it was understood in 1787, 1789, and said the historical understanding is that the Constitution creates a hierarchical judiciary, which means both that the inferior federal courts have to listen to what the Supreme Court says, and conversely, that the Supreme Court has a leading role in defining federal law for the federal judiciary. And there's a surprising amount of agreement on this constitutional principle among both originalists and non-originalists. They come to it in a different way, but a lot of people agree there's a hierarchical judiciary, and many of you might think, well, I never even thought of an alternative. Okay, so then what does that mean? Well, it certainly means that if a case goes to the Supreme Court from a lower federal court, the Supreme Court can reverse it. But it also means something more, that the US Supreme Court can establish precedents, not just in the case before it, but for all those lower court cases the Supreme Court can no longer review. We don't often think about this, but when the Supreme Court first started out, it didn't have the power of certiorari. It couldn't pick and choose the cases that it heard. It had mandatory appellate jurisdiction in every single case. So it actually could, on a case-by-case -case basis, review what the lower federal courts did. But then, starting in the late 19th century and really kicking off in 1925 and 1988, gradually the Supreme Court had discretionary review because it simply could not hear all of the cases from the lower federal courts. Now, I will pause and say, in the early 20th century, the Supreme Court, which had only limited discretionary jurisdiction, um, could barely handle 500 cases per year. 500 cases per year. In the 1980s, they were deciding 150 cases per year on average. Um, one wonders why they have the summers off. Anyway, um, today they're deciding only 70 or 80 cases per year, and sometimes even 50 or 60 in recent, in recent terms. Um, and so that means when the Supreme Court decides a case, it needs to set a precedent for all of those now hundreds of thousands of lower court cases that it cannot review on a case-by-case -case basis. Just imagine the world if Miranda only applied in Arizona, or if McDonald, which purported to extend the Second Amendment to states and localities, had no application outside the city of Chicago. Very different world. And so we accept that the Supreme Court can establish precedents for the lower federal courts, but how should it do it? I referred to one, one thing a little bit. It's actually arguably problematic under the constitutional scheme that we have if the Supreme Court decides cases on extraordinarily narrow grounds because it's only deciding somewhere between 50 and 80 of the hundreds of thousands of cases that lower federal courts are hearing. And when the Supreme Court decides cases on very narrow, often called minimalist grounds, the Supreme Court's effectively delegating to the lower federal courts enormous power to define the content of federal law with very limited guidance from the Supreme Court. So there's at least a case to be made that minimalism itself is problematic at the Supreme Court. But there's also a case to be made that maybe the kinds of precedents the Supreme Court establishes matter. And here I will say, even if one is an originalist, and even if one believes the Supreme Court could be originalist, it may be problematic as a practical matter for the Supreme Court to just tell lower courts, go do originalism. And I'm gonna to point to one recent case that I think is arguably, arguably problematic along these lines, and that's the, the recent Bruin decision on the Second Amendment. The Bruin decision certainly held that there is a in, in a broad individual right to bear arms. And then it said to lower courts, look, the government now has to find, identify some historical analog 
to justify its regulation. So to, just, to justify a regulation today, you've got to look to something in the past that seems similar. Okay, well, you can kind of see the argument, but here's what the Supreme Court didn't say. It didn't say when in history one should look, if one should look when the original Constitution was written and ratified in 1789, 1787, 1789, when the Bill of Rights was ratified in 1791, are we supposed to look at the 1860s when the 14th Amendment was added to the Constitution? Bruin does not say, and there is kind of a difference between the late 18th century and the late 19th century. Bruin does not tell lower courts what the level of generality is for determining what is a proper historical analog, and I think the Supreme Court right now is considering a case that raises these questions and may provide some clarity, but it certainly did not provide that clarity in Bruin. Another problem, with an analysis like Bruin, historical, good historical inquiry takes time. It takes institutional resources. An institution with nine members that hears only 50 to 80 cases per year and gets dozens upon dozens of amicus briefs to help it out might be able to conduct that originalist analysis and do a pretty good job. But lower courts that don't get the summers off and have a much larger caseload than the US Supreme Court, courts of appeals that have mandatory appellate jurisdiction and not certiorari power and do not get many, sometimes any amicus briefs to help out, they may not have the institutional resources to conduct this kind of historical inquiry. And the final thing that may be problematic about a, a decision like Bruin, again, not in terms of what it held, but what it told the lower courts to decide, to do going forward. There's always the possibility of some lower court resistance. Now, I do believe that every lower federal court judge in this country believes deeply in our legal system, in our constitution, and believes deeply in a system of hierarchical precedent. But I think we've all seen over the course of time decisions that we might, we might define to be right or wrong from the Supreme Court. And lower court judges feel the same way, right? They are a little, re a little reluctant to take some precedents all the way where the Supreme Court might want them to. And so standards like strict scrutiny as opposed to rational basis scrutiny really do provide guidance and also arguably rein in lower court judges that might not be too keen on applying a particular precedent. And what we have seen in the post-Bruin era are widely different lower court decisions as they're trying to come up with which historical analog when, and one has to think that some of that might have to be, might have to do with how the lower courts view Bruin itself. So the types of precedents matter in providing guidance. Now, I do want to continue on with one thing. Are there some areas where the Supreme Court cannot establish precedent not only for itself, but even for the lower courts, too. And here I want to say a couple of words about methodological precedent. There's a really strong assumption in our culture that every single judge can decide for himself or herself which methodology to apply. There's not a really good explanation for why this is the case, but the assumption seems to be that although some aspects of the judicial power apply to a court, other aspects of the judicial power actually apply to each individual judge. And one part of the judicial power, it seems, is to choose a methodology. And that would be true not only for each individual Supreme Court justice, but also every single individual lower federal court judge. This is kind of a mixed bag for originalism. The lack of presidential status for methodology allowed Justice Scalia to start basically a methodological revolution in the 1980s, advocating originalism in constitutional interpretation, textualism in statutory interpretation, even though those methodologies were by no means ascendant or even recognized by the majority of the Supreme Court at the time. But this also means that at a time like now, when originalism is ascendant, that strongly limits its staying power because new, methodolo new methodologies can come along, new justices can come along, new lower court judges can come along 
and say, actually, we prefer something different. Sure, we'll, we'll apply, the lower court judges will apply the precedents. Many members of the Supreme Court will also apply the precedents. But they'll say, going forward, we want a new methodology. And so the staying power of originalism may be quite limited. But I want to say on a positive side, that could be a good thing, right? Not just to stick with the methodology because that's how we've always done it, but continuously to question, try to improve, try to change, and try to re-justify the methodologies that we have chosen. If one believes that methodology should be defended on normative grounds, that's a very good thing for our legal system. Okay, um, fascinating discussion. I suspect that there are some panelists who would like to react and respond a bit to each other. Uh, so, Professor uh, Dean Kozel. Uh, sure, so uh, I'll just say very briefly, I, uh, I think all of, all of us have a lot of common ground in, in our discussion. Uh, and I love the, the uh, points about vertical precedent. I think there's a lot to discuss in terms of the scope of, of Supreme Court vertical precedent. Uh, but one thing I'll mention for now, going back to Gary's comments, which were, were great as always, I suppose I just don't see the issue of deferring to precedent as preferring precedent to the Constitution itself uh, any more than I would see looking to the original history of a constitutional provision as preferring that original history to the Constitution itself. I guess I see it more as interpreting the Constitution in light of factors, including the text, including the structure, including the history, and including precedent. And I suppose I, I think of it this way. Technically, you could interpret the First Amendment, say, without regard to the original meaning of the tax, and in fact the Supreme Court has done it for years. Uh, but it would take an awful lot to convince me that historical considerations were off the table for a judge who wanted to bring them to bear in thinking about the meaning of the First Amendment, and I suppose I think of precedent the same way. You could interpret the First Amendment without regard to precedent, uh, but I'd need to see an awful lot before I thought that a judge actually couldn't make that decision, that the Constitution somehow took that away. So I think that's where I come out. Well, I would, I would agree with all of that. I, I don't, if, if all you're doing with prior decisions is looking at them and using them as potential sources of guidance and wisdom on a case-specific basis, 100%, I'm, I'm all in favor of that. My only issue is whether, as a matter of law, they acquire a certain force or status simply by virtue of being a prior decision rather than being good evidence of the right answer. I mean, you can make categorical arguments that certain classes of judicial decisions are, by their nature, by certain features of them, especially likely to be good evidence of right answers. And I'm totally fine with that as well. Uh, so I have uh, two comments, uh, one on Gary and the uh, other on... Did you pull the mic? I'm sorry. Okay, uh, one on Gary and the other on uh, 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 Tara's uh, remarks. So I think one uh, difference between Gary and uh, me, and I think uh, in that sense I'm along with Randy, uh, is the way of interpreting the Constitution. The way I think of the way we should interpret the Constitution is the Constitution is not created ex nihilo, uh, but against the background of Anglo-American jurisprudence. And I think the practice of precedent was so well established, there's nothing in the Constitution that seems to me uh, to displace it. And the fact that uh, uh, there's judicial review isn't really different from England, and Parliament was supreme there, and yet uh, the judges on occasion applied precedent even when they thought it was completely wrong in written law. And so they were preferring their, their um, uh, precedents uh, to uh, something that was uh, supreme under their structure, the, the statutes of Parliament. Um, so um, now, with respect to Tara, I think two, I want to weave two points uh, together. 
uh, in uh, responding to a very uh, cogent remark. So one is about the question of can lower courts deal with history and that their institutional capacity. I think we have to not look at institutional capacity as static, but as dynamic. So if we start to see decisions like Bruin, I'm not talking whether it's correct or not, but if we see more decisions that require uh, inferior courts to do historical inquiry, <coughs> the bar will reorient itself to historical inquiry. And maybe there'll be actually some law professors at our schools who actually will teach originalism and constitutional law. And that, I think, will be a huge uh, advantage. Uh, so I think um, that will change. We want to, what now, again, is a big objective of what I would call second generation originalism is to create a culture of originalism. And therefore, a decision like Bruin has some really great secondary uh, consequences. And I think that goes to the, the next point, which is, I think, a very powerful point, which is it's quite true that I think we never have had methodological settlement. Uh, and that's, uh, in some sense, it's a debate about what the rule of recognition is for constitutional law. And I don't think that has been settled. I think originalism, I disagree a little that I don't think originalism and textualism were ever off the table. I don't think that, uh, uh, but I don't, I think you're absolutely right uh, that originalism and textualism are now not still the only things on the table. But that brings me back to the important element of the judiciary in creating a self-sustaining culture to support it. You might think, and there's a great article uh, about this, that the justices themselves are not only deciding cases, but they're kind of Republican schoolmasters. Uh, and one of the things they can do is to create a culture of, rep of small r, uh, Republican judging, which includes originalism, and that makes it harder to displace. Uh, and that's a real, a real challenge for originalists today, precisely because of our law schools and our uh, legal establishment. And so I think they have to think of all sorts of ways of, of creating a dynamic culture that will make originalism more easy to sustain for the future. Uh, yeah, so, so thanks so much for, for those comments. I, I'm certain that lower courts could get more institutional capacity to do the kind of historical analysis that Bruin requires, and also Kennedy versus Bremerton um, in the Establishment Clause context asks lower courts to do something, something similar. So I think we are getting, getting more decisions along these lines. Um, I think realistically, no matter how many law professors ultimately teach originalism in the way that you're, in, in, in the way that Professor McGinnis is, is hoping and Professor Lawson is doubting, <laughs> um, uh, I, I think just looking, looking at the dockets of the lower courts, I think they need more clarity. And we shouldn't be in a situation where you're not even sure which century to look at to figure out which, which, what history, history to apply. Um, I do, think, I, I, I do think we're not going to get methodological settlement. I think you're right that originalism and textualism were by no means off the table. There was a deep history of textualism. Um, depending on how you read our Supreme Court decisions, also a deep history of originalism uh, that Will Bode and Steve Sachs have, have pointed to. Um, again, it depends on how you define originalism um, to get there. Uh, and I think the Supreme Court can certainly provide guidance. Um, just to stir the pot a little bit, I do want to say I, I think there's broad agreement that courts can't require certain methodologies. The Supreme Court can't require that of lower courts and that each individual judge can decide for themselves. I think it's unclear exactly what counts as a methodology, though. This is, this is coming up in the debates right now over Chevron. Um, courts actually do a lot more than just articulate particular tests in particular cases. They articulate standards of review, like abuse of discretion, reasonableness, substantial evidence. And this is something that's been part of our system for quite some time. And I think a big question that we have is like, is that okay? Because the Supreme Court and courts of appeals have been doing it for a long time. And if, depending on how we define methodological precedent, we could actually be taking off some really important, taking some really, really important precedents off the table, even in the vertical space. Uh, Professor Lawson, you've been 
furiously writing notes, yeah. <laughs> uh, and and perhaps fairly could be described as taking some fire. Uh, I, I I wondered whether you had um, yeah, just a couple a, of a, a couple of very quick observations, and yeah. then we'll, we'll we'll hear from every, everybody else. Um, Two incredibly important points that came from, from the folks uh, to my left. Uh, one you just heard about methodological precedents. I think Tara is exactly right about this. What, what courts can do, e even, even under my theory where the Supreme Court can bind courts inferior to it, what can it bind them to? It can bind them to meanings of texts, but that's not the same thing as binding them to a method of decision making. Uh, outside the context of the Constitution, as we all know, the Supreme Court is hearing a case, this two cases this term, about whether it's going to overrule Chevron. Well, what does it mean to overrule <laughs> Chevron? Does that mean the EPA will no longer be able to draw bubbles over factories? Because that was actually the judgment in the Chevron case, was that it could reasonably draw bubbles up. No, of course that's not what it's about. The, the question is whether it's going to be giving instructions to lower courts about how they're supposed to go about deciding a whole series of future cases. And I, I have grave doubts uh, whether they have that power uh, for the same reason that I have grave doubts about whether Congress uh, can order uh, federal courts uh, how to decide cases. I don't, I don't know that the Supreme Court's superior status, supreme status, lets it do that either. Um, on the background of the Constitution, uh, John is asking all of the right questions, is posing all of the right issues. I mean, of course, the Constitution is not written on a blank slate. Uh, it's written uh, in the context of, uh, uh, at an earlier panel uh, yesterday, I don't know if Professor Stiniford is in the audience here, but uh, he, he invoked the common law background, what I would call the ancient Constitution, which sort of predates, underlies, is incorporated into the Constitution that we have. So, yeah, there is no doubt that the judicial power includes certain things. I mean, that's why it's not defined in the Constitution. Everybody kind of knew what the judicial power was. You read the Judiciary Act, right? Uh, and it, it says basically nothing about how the forms and methods of the equity courts and the methods and procedures of the Admiralty. I mean, everybody kind of knew what it was that courts did. And uh, yeah, and there's no doubt that one of the things they did was look to their prior decisions, the, the two questions that remain from the standpoint of the original meaning of Article 3 are, number one, what exactly is that practice that they were doing? Was it looking at long settled ancient constitution-like norms because they were good evidence of what was right, just, and natural, good evidence of the right answer. That's a, that's a very different thing from simply looking at past decisions because they're past decisions. It's what I call epistemological use of precedent, and I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. And then the other is whether the notion that you can do that, whatever that is, in the face of supreme law, like parliamentary, you know, the king in parliament or the queen in parliament. How does that translate into a regime that provides a written rather than unwritten constitution, which announces itself pretty obviously as, as supreme law? So, again, I don't think the case that I make is, is a knockdown, drag out case. I've, I've never thought it was. As I said, I was, I was looking I've been looking for three decades for, for people to talk me out of it. Uh, I think it's a presumptive case, and the question is whether the kinds of practices that John describes are sufficiently well-defined, well-established, part of what I would call the ancient constitution, so that they can generate a strong enough doctrine of precedent to get to where John or Randy or anyone else would want to go. Uh, yeah, uh, J Professor Grove. Yeah. If other people want to say stuff, that's fine. Part of me? Um, is, do other people want to say something first? Well, um, I, I, I think it's okay if you respond. Um, th there's, there's something I want to get to next about, if everyone's okay with it, about 
inferior court judges, and um, I've not taken offense at that term because it is in the Constitution, of course, and I'm a textualist, but yes. go ahead. And one term that's not in the Constitution, right, is justice. Right. <laughs> right. So we can call, call them all judges. Um, so, you know, uh, so Gary Lawson was just saying that um, the Supreme Court cannot establish certain types of precedents for the lower courts. And I'm genuinely raising this as a question because this is something that I'm puzzling about a lot as people are now questioning the presidential status of Chevron. And just putting aside what people think of Chevron on the merits, and maybe there are, there are, problems, there are problems with it um, in, in the view of some. But the idea that the Supreme Court can't say to lower courts, this is how you should review agency decisions strikes me as very antithetical to what courts have been doing for quite some time, as I referred to, sta setting standards of review, abuse of discretion, reasonableness, substantial evidence. Um, and also, if the Supreme Court can't do that, how can it issue a decision like Bruin that says, here's how you need to analyze Second Amendment cases going forward? Because both of them are about methodology and analytical analysis and approaches to decision making, and not just this, that, and the other, not just saying that the Constitution means why in a particular case. The other thing I'll say about the broader theory of precedent, and I think this is what makes many folks squeamish about Gary's views, um, if, this, if the Constitution does indeed, as he argues, prohibit precedent, prohibit reliance on precedent, then the Supreme Court acts, and, and yet the Supreme Court's going to, going to rely on precedent as, as he acknowledges, the Supreme Court's actions seem highly illegitimate to us. Um, and this is something that I, I think is not recognized enough, how often the Supreme Court in our history has actually viewed the law in a particular way and done something else, which seems legally illegitimate. Now, if that happens once in a blue moon, as I think it has, um, maybe that's okay. But what Professor Lawson is suggesting is they're doing illegitimate stuff all the time. Well, I would say they're doing unconstitutional stuff all the time. No, I'm serious, this is a serious question. Whether that makes it illegitimate is actually a separate question. It's not, it's not the same question. So, parochial interests. Uh, <laughs> I'm interested in a perspective about a question as it pertains to precedent and inferior court judges that you haven't addressed. So as I understand, there seems to be broad agreement with the idea that Supreme Court precedent binds inferior courts. What about the horizontal precedent of inferior courts where Courts of Appeals, the precedent setting inferior courts, judge typically in three judge panels and can over, uh, only overrule precedent on bunk and rehearings on bunk. Does that square with your perspective, Professor Lawson? If so, why? If not, why? No, I'm, I, have, I have the same problems with that, that I have a horizontal precedent at the Supreme Court level. And, and of course, think about district courts within a circuit. They don't consider themselves Well, they don't make law. Bound I, I, district by, judges yeah, always yeah. don't like it when I say this, but district judges don't make law. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, as I said, what, what I think gives the Supreme Court power to do things that the Constitution normally frowns upon is because the Constitution authorizes it to do it, um, your panels are not inferior to each other. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I don't think you can get a textual escape from the obligation to decide cases in accordance with governing law. Well, what do you think, though, about the notion that by statute, Congress, which created those inferior courts, also created a process on bank review that would seem to contemplate that that is how it has to operate. Well, uh, Congress can create whatever structures it wants. What I don't think Congress can do is tell federal judges how to decide cases. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where would they get that power? The power to make all laws necessary and proper 
for carrying into execution the judicial power? Well, th that means they can give them buildings and funds and law clerks if they're foolish enough to allocate funds for law clerks and computers and all those sorts of things. I don't think it gives Congress the power to tell the courts how to decide cases. Uh, Congress does it all the time. Um, I'm an administrative law guy. Administrative law is full of statutes ordering courts to affirm agencies even if the court thinks the agency is wrong, as long as the agency isn't terribly wrong. I, 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 I've never understood where Congress gets the power to do that. All right, any reactions to that? Oh. So, sure, I, I would say uh, I have the same take on courts of appeals uh, as, as Gary just noted. I think going, requiring en banc review in order to deviate from circuit law can be understood as a prudential practice and, and a good idea, but I think it's not lawfully required, and I think the best evidence of that is the cascade of situations in which courts of appeals allow three judge panels to overrule circuit law. Right, sometimes with some sort of procedural mechanism, like circulation of an opinion to the off-panel judges first, but sometimes in light of other events, like the Supreme Court has issued uh, an intervening decision, right? And so I think, as I said, I think it's a good uh, to require en banc review before you, you overrule precedent in lots of situations, at least putting aside something like a clear change in the Supreme Court's case law, for example. But I view that as, as more of a prudential the judgment, and I, I'll mention one other thing. I think, and this is something I, I think about a lot, a lot of the discussions we've been having about stare decisis uh, are going to find them w their way into discussions about the en banc process really soon. They're starting to emerge more and more. Even things like the pure question of, well, is it a suitable reason to vote to go en banc that you thought uh, the three-judge panel got it wrong? Or should you require some sort of special justification to vote to go en banc in the same way that you might require special justification to reconsider horizontal precedent on the US Supreme Court? I think these are really fascinating questions. They're incredibly important, and I think they're just beginning to get attention. So one question I think is raised by this, a more uh, yeah, deeper, closer to the uh, I'm mind. sorry, a deeper question may be that, um, um, whether or not Congress can change rules of precedent. Because, of course, if the rules of precedent are common law rules, it may be that Congress can change the rules of precedent and create these uh, 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 structures. Now, of course, they have to, they're limited by the necessary and proper clause. They can't create precedent, special rules for certain kinds of cases. But I, <coughs> I don't think it's clear if you agree that, there, that precedent rules are common law rules that come uh, from uh, the structure of the Constitution, just power, that doesn't necessarily mean that Congress is disabled from getting involved. Well, if they were common law rules in 1787, did they get baked into Article Three in 1788 so that they are no longer common law rules, they're now constitutional norms? Well, I don't think so. I mean, uh, there, were, there were certain, the judges applied hearsay rules, all sorts of rules, and as common law rules, uh, as rules of evidence, and I'm not sure they were baked in. They had the judicial power, I think, to create them, uh, but uh, I don't think we would think they are baked in, and because, of course, the common law can, can change, and I certainly think the practice of the Supreme Court, maybe we shouldn't <laughs> evaluate that at all, is certainly not to look to exactly what the precedent rules are in uh, 1787 to decide what uh, uh, our precedent rules are today. Yeah. So um, getting back to Judge Pryor's initial, uh, <laughs> initial question, I think one thing we, we could step back and say, well, if Congress clearly has the power to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. That's in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 9. And Article 3 <laughs> contemplates that there will be inferior courts as Congress decides. Mm -hmm. So if we step back and say, well, let's just say Congress established these courts and then and said to the courts, go and figure out the precedent stuff. We're not, we, we, we don't know what you're going to do. Just like figure it out on your own. Could they have established horizontal precedent at the Court of Appeals level with an en banc review session? review system. I think that under Gary's theories, the answer is no, but under Randy's and John's theories, the answer is yes, they absolutely could for all the reasons the, the Supreme Court can follow horizontal precedent. If that's true, 
then um, it strikes me as not problematic at all for Congress exercising its authority um, over the inferior federal courts under the Necessary and Proper Clause to, to establish the system too. And let's be clear, it's not Congress telling the lower courts how to decide cases. If Congress were telling the lower courts how to decide cases, we would have a very different system and cases out of the Fifth Circuit would be exactly like cases out of the Ninth Circuit, which last I checked, they're not. Uh, the courts of appeals are, are quite capable of doing things on their own, it's setting up a system, a system for, for judges to follow. Um, and if it would be okay for those judges to do it on their own, um, then I think it, it is also okay for Congress to set some boundaries. As they establish rules of jurisdiction and mm -hmm. procedure and et cetera, right? Right. Um, all right, we've had a lot of great discussion among the panelists. Uh, we have about a half an hour left. Uh, so we're now uh, at a time where we could, I think, open it up um, unless someone has something burning they want to say last uh, for Q&A. Uh, we have microphones in the middle of the room. We have a lot of people lining up. Uh, all right, so I'll do what I usually do uh, some, with some success and sometimes not. I don't mind. We have a lot of time here, but, but there's a limit. None of you are panelists. We want questions so that we can hear from our experts. Uh, so it's okay to set up a question with a little bit of background, but let's, let's keep in mind we want a question and we want to get to it fairly quickly. Uh, so I'll begin with the front mic uh, first. Uh, yes, sir. Chuck Hurley, Iowa. My question to any or all panelists is, have you heard of this quote? from Abe Lincoln, and if so, what are the implications of it? Do you agree with it or disagree with it? And it's a quote in regard to Dred Scott uh, in his inaugural address. He said, uh, the candid citizen must confess that if the policy of the government on vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by decisions of the Supreme Court, the instant they are made in ordinary litigation, uh, the people, we the people, will have ceased to be our own rulers, having to that extent practically resigned their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal. I'm just wondering if, if that lies, if, if he was way out of bounds, I've used that a lot of times in argumentation. No I, think, yeah. Yeah. no, I think he's dead right, um, but I'm not sure you'd get a lot of dispute because yep. the position he was responding to was that the Supreme Court decision foreclosed all other interpreters in all other contexts from disagreeing. That's not a position that I don't, I don't think anybody today on any spectrum in any context takes that kind of, of hardline view. Um, the, the real bite of, of, of President Lincoln's comments is that the, this would be a whole different panel. The Supreme Court is not the only interpreter of the Constitution. There are lots of other interpreters, Congress, presidents, state officials, jurors, citizens when they're voting. Uh, and uh, certainly the Supreme Court has power over courts inferior to it. It does not have power over anybody else. Anybody else? Uh, in the back, next. Hi, uh, Randy Barnett from Georgetown Law. I have a genuine uh, good faith question for Randy and Tara, because um, I share with you the belief that there's such a thing as vertical stare decisis, and in such a system, I'm curious to know what exactly lower courts are bound to follow. So what is your conception of the holding of a case, which I think is crucial to knowing what the scope of precedent is, and how would that conception of the holding uh, be reconciled with the fact that at the founding, the Supreme Court uh, issued seriatim opinions, justice by justice, and did not issue opinions of the court like we see today? Sure, so uh, thank you for the question. It's a great question. It, it plugs into uh, the debates we've been having about methodological precedent and about Chevron. So maybe I'll just set the stage, uh, maybe I'll just set the stage a little bit um, to contextualize based on what Randy said, it, it's been 
I think, implicit in what we've discussed so far, but there's this question of how strong precedent binds, right? But you don't get there until you define what the precedent is. What I always think of is its scope, the universe of propositions for which it stands as binding authority. Because even an opinion that we all agree was lawfully issued, well, not all of it binds, right? Like, as Randy said, it goes back to this age-old debate, what's holding and what's dicta. Well, that starts to get us down the road, but you know, as Tara and as Gary were talking about, if you look at the realm of Supreme Court opinions, there's a lot of stuff that isn't obviously holding, but that gets treated as binding, commonly, vertically, for example. So, uh, you know, if you, I always think of it as a spectrum. So, on the one hand, you've got the the targeted application of a legal rule to the specific facts of the case. That's definitely going to be binding vertically. Okay. On the far other end, you have what, what Tara alluded to as a sort of broad methodology of interpretation. If the court says, in all future cases, regardless of the constitutional provision before you, lower courts must be originalist. I think that's a much harder case to say is binding, right? That's a methodological precedent that I think is, is pretty broad. What gets hard are all the spots on the spectrum in between those two. And there are tons of them, right? The, the doctrine of strict scrutiny. Okay, if you have a content-based restriction on speech, you need a compelling interest and narrowly tailored means for, to uphold it. So I've got to apply that to every statute that has a content-based restriction on speech. Like, might that not seem like dicta in the classical sense? Uh, or similarly, you know, Gary mentioned Chevron. Even though I've defended a pretty strong version of precedent, I agree that Chevron is beyond the scope of precedent. I've argued that Chevron doesn't get binding effect because what it asks of future judges is to make an interpretive inference about statutes that aren't presented to the court in Chevron, right? So I think it goes too far, but it's a spectrum, it's a really hard case. And so I think it's, it's a really uh, difficult set of issues. I, to my mind, the best we can do and what I've tried to do is focus on what are the parts that are at least pretty well established and can we use them to start to build up a, a tradition-based or a practice-based account, right? So even though I think doctrines like strict scrutiny could create some real questions of whether they're vertically binding, the courts have seemed to accept that, right? The next generation of these discussions is going to be cases like Bruin, for example, and maybe cases like Chevron that push the boundaries a little far. Uh, I don't have my mind made up on, on all those, frankly. Um, but I think the sets of considerations that we've been talking about are the ones that we have to keep focusing on, this notion that at the end of the day, precedent is about requiring of the judge something as an institutional matter, but also allowing the judge to bring to bear the individuality uh, that is part and parcel of why the judge received the commission in the first place. Yeah. So. Fabulous question, and I believe, I believe, Randy, you're doing some work in this area as, as well. Um, so I, I look forward to, to hearing more from you on this. Um, so this is what, one of the reasons I'm concerned about the argument that um, something like Chevron can't even be precedential. Um, if it is true, and I think a lot of us on, on, on this panel and throughout the Legal Academy agree, that Article Three creates a hierarchical system of precedent, if it is also true that the Supreme Court is only gonna hear a fraction of the lower court cases, and so can only serve as, as the leader in defining the content of, of federal law by going beyond the case and saying, hey, here's what you guys should do in all these cases we can't review, then the holdings of Supreme Court decisions necessarily have to be broader than is this particular action in this particular case valid or invalid. The court needs to be able to establish standards of scrutiny, implementation tests. It needs to be able to establish historical tests if that's what it, it, it decides to do. Um, and so I, I feel like the attack on methodological precedent, which I agree with at the broad, at the broad stage that, that Randy was talking about, you know, you go and do originalism, even if, even if the Supreme Court can't do that, it kind of needs to be able to do a lot in between, um, just as a matter of theory and constitutional structure. I will say as a matter of practice, this is something we should, we should not overlook. Lower court judges really pay attention to everything in Supreme Court decisions. So there's been some empirical work on this. Even stuff that we would all agree is dicta has, tremendous, has a tremendous impact in, in the inferior federal judiciary. And, and so I think when we're thinking about the theory, we also have to look at 
how much our theories may actually be misaligned with what's going on in the lower federal courts. Yeah, there's a, um, there's a precedent in my court where um, our court said there is dicta and there is dicta and then there is Supreme Court dicta. <laughs> in the front. Uh, thank you to the panel. It's uh, been a great discussion. Adam Griffin with Pacific Legal Foundation. Um, my question concerns Bruin. There's been a lot of criticism of Bruin and its methodology, particularly sort of practical from the standpoint of both um, finding sort of how difficult it is to do the history and tradition analysis for lower courts um, that are very busy and then also maybe practical consequences. Um, and so my, my question though is how much of this is just it takes time to work things pure and that part of precedent moving forward if we're making originalist precedent is to work the doctrine pure. So how many First Amendment cases have there been and how many Fourth Amendment cases have there been before we get to a more coherent doctrine? And so I'm wondering if um, rather than Bruin being necessarily incorrect, if it just takes you know years of lower courts percolating and deciding cases and then you get di different district courts having done historical research and it starts to coalesce. I'm wondering how much of it is a problem with the framework and being something new versus taking time to work the doctrine out over time. Well, I, go ahead, Dara. Go ahead. It's, it, it's a beautiful tie-in actually with Randy Barnett's question because it goes to what it is that you get out of decisions. Formally, what you get out of a decision is a judgment. The thing that deprives people of life, liberty, and property is not the opinion, the, the press release that accompanies what the court does. The thing that deprives people of life, liberty, and property that presidents can execute, that the Constitution considers law, is the judgment. So the explanation for the judgment, how far it goes, to what other circumstances it covers, how much content are you providing to the legal terms that form the basis for the judgment, I think you're absolutely right. That may take a whole series, years, decades, uh, in order to get a f larger flavor of exactly what it is that the content of the legal norm consists of that's generating these judgments. Anybody else? Anybody else? If I could just add, uh, so uh, going back to something that uh, Tara said, nevertheless, you can have a criticism of Bruin uh, I think uh, Tara's criticism is very cogent that uh, if it doesn't focus on where you should look at the history, whether it's in 1860 or in 1789, that's an error of the court that it really it should be clearer about because if we have those judgments, we're going to get to the results much more quickly than if we're confused about even where we're to look at matters. And so I think uh, uh, that's something that the court needs to be very careful about but precisely because, uh, Judge Pryor's point, point, the lower courts are going to look very carefully at what the Supreme Court does in this respect. And if the Supreme Court is clearer about, if it's clear and not sloppy about these things, will uh, percolate uh, much more quickly. And that's, that's a really advantage to the rule of law. So it really, I think, originalism and certainly changing the law puts, I think, an even greater premium on clarity so that the, whatever the shock to the system is, and of course there is going to be a shock to the system in changing the law, uh, is the least uh, 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 possible uh, to get the right uh, determination. And that, I think, the court may have fallen down in, in, in Bruin precisely for the reasons the Tower suggested. Right, so um, first I want to give a shout out to Ryan Williams, which I meant to do earlier, who's written about lower court originalism and raised, the, raised some of these institutional capacity concerns. Um, so I think one can always do better, right? And I also think it's, it's, it's important to recognize, you know, I, I know it's hard, I, I understand that it is hard to define doctrine, whether you're a Supreme Court justice or a court of appeals judge. There's a lot to do. There's a huge, huge desire often to decide only the case before you. Um, sometimes that's the only thing you can get two or five votes for, depending on whether you're a panel or, or the US Supreme Court. Uh, so what I'm advocating is an effort to do more and to do better. Um, and I think the Supreme Court can. Um, 
I think when you look at various doctrines, yes, they can get worked out over time. Um, but they can get it worked out a lot more quickly when the Supreme Court issues clearer decisions. Um, and so the effort should always be, in my view, to do that, even recognizing that real world judges are always going to come up short some of the time. Okay, uh, next turn is the back. Uh, thank you to the panel. Uh, Garrett Anderson from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, so Judge Bork uh, wrote and spoke a lot about old opinions he didn't necessarily agree with, and that might have not been based in the Constitution. Um, but he nevertheless said that some of those opinions need to be uh, upheld because they're so deeply embedded in jurisprudence. Is the deeply embedded argument a valid justification for upholding bad law? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Justice Scalia thought the same thing by the way. Uh, he, he actually had a very strong belief that if there were established reliance institutions built up around something, uh, no matter how bad he thought it was, he analogized it to adverse possession. You can actually get someone's title uh, even though you're a wrongdoer. You know, this raises a question I've been curious about, uh, Professor Lawson, and that is, it is true that um, in his writing about stare decisis, Justice Thomas has cited your scholarship and, and drawn on it, but he's also cited Caleb Nelson's yep. um, scholarship. And, and I wondered to what extent Caleb Nelson's formulation of demonstrably erroneous precedent, you, in your mind, differs from your own, if at all. Yeah, it's, it, it goes to the, to the question that, that Randy raised earlier, how, how, how confident do you have to be that something is a mistake before you proclaim it a mistake? That is, just take, take as a given for a moment the, 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 the loss of insanity, right? That if there is in fact the meaning of the Constitution and there's the meaning of the precedent, you choose the meaning of the Constitution, that doesn't tell you how you have to ascertain the meaning of the Constitution and how confident you need to be that you've got it right. Um, for all the reasons, well, some, some of the reasons I suggested that I'm dubious about Thayer's rule of clear error for reviewing statutes, I'm also dubious about applying a demonstrably erroneous as opposed to an erroneous, I mean, if you can't demonstrate it, then it's not erroneous, right? So it's got to be, of course it's going to be demonstrably erroneous, but what I think it means by that is a level of confidence that is fairly high something approximating a beyond a reasonable doubt mental state. Uh, I don't think that's necessary in order to figure out what you think the answer is. So if, if he means by that, which I think he does, that, that heightened standard of proof, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm open to argument on that, but skeptical. Anybody else? Okay, um, next question from the front. My name is Tom Fogarty. I'm a student at Duke Law School. Uh, Professor McGinnis, you mentioned before how uh, we can't simply do uh, stare decisis and precedent as it was done back in 1787. Uh, but today, as we attempt to redefine what stare decisis looks like, to what extent is the historical practice of uh, precedent and stare decisis relevant to defining what factors we look at when considering whether to uh, overturn a decision? Uh, well, I think it uh, really just tells us that, uh, in my view, that there were things that the courts looked at other than the correctness of the decision uh, uh, to uh, apply or to retain a precedent. And the most important, I think, uh, is reliance. I could conceive in some other world, we could think of maybe there's some other uh, consequential effect. Uh, so I think that's really what it tells us. Exactly how we weigh that against other matters, I don't think uh, the common law exactly tells us. And that's really, a, once one decides that this is a matter of the common law, things can change. Now, I don't mean it changes in a, in a way that uh, is just a, a kind of cost-benefit analysis, but we really, because that's a question about how the, uh, debate about how the common law changes. 
it has to change in uh, accordance with much more general uh, issues. I've offered some reasons why it should uh, now embrace perspective overruling uh, that try to capture some facts about uh, our modern society that really weren't present at the time, and that's the advantage of understanding precedent as a, a common law rule. It, it's not set in stone, but judges have to be responsible in reflecting the changes to uh, reflect real uh, transformations uh, and not uh, just change them willy-nilly according to what their, uh, their preferences are. And that's always a difficult matter once one entrusts judges with any common law responsibilities. Any reactions? Okay, um, in the back. Good morning, um, I'm Ram Desapatla. I'm a 2L at Notre Dame Law School. Um, my question was regarding um, Professor Grove's point uh, about the need for clarity and um, the, the, the drawbacks of more narrow holdings. I'm wondering on the flip side how, uh, I wanted to hear about how the court could potentially do that without running into the dual risks of um, one, giving advisory opinions, and two, preventing their ability to explicate, explicate doctrine in a more nuanced way in the future if you have a broad precedent that you have to narrow versus having a narrow precedent that you can expand? Uh, so, you know, I think this is, this is along the lines of the debates over holding versus dicta, um, and goes back, to, goes back to Randy's points about the scope of a precedent. Um, can precedents go beyond deciding the case at hand? Um, I think that in our legal system, the answer is yes. Uh, and we disagree maybe about how broad they can go, but they can go beyond deciding the case at hand. And one of the things I've, I've tried to underscore is that the Supreme Court can only perform its constitutional function um, as the hierarchical leader of the federal judiciary if it can go beyond the case at hand, even if they were deciding 150 or, you know, my preference, four or 500 cases per year. I know a lot of people don't share that preference. Um, it still would not, it would be only a drop in the bucket as compared to what, um, what the lower courts do. So I think just as a, as, as a if that's incorrect, um, then we've lost our hierarchical system, and I think that that's at odds with the original meaning of the text of, of Article 3. Um, I do think it's a very fair point to say, well, what if we're going in a new area and we don't really know what to do with it? And, and I, think, I think, for example, Justice Scalia's decision in Heller is quite defensible along these lines, right? The Supreme Court, for the first time in a very long, first time in history, recognized an individual right to bear arms. And whether you agree or disagree with that, uh, that was a very new thing. And Justice Scalia, I think, very understandably said, we're not going to decide everything here. But that was 2008. And one would have thought that by 2022, when the Supreme Court decided Bruin and scores of lower court decisions were out there to help guide the court, the court could have done a lot more in Bruin. So as I said before, it's not that I think the justices can automatically come up with great answers in every case, but I do think the goal should be to strive for that rather than striving to decide the cases on the, on the narrowest ground. Yeah, just one, one more thought on that, and this is sort of trite and banal, but I mean, if you had a scheme of what I guess we would call cadi justice, people show up, you win, you lose, you win, you lose, you win, you lose, very hard to generate a doctrine of precedent out of that. I would think by the time we get to 1788 and we have a term like the judicial power, it, it, it's contemplating something quite different than that kind of cadi justice. It's contemplating that the judgments, the legally binding things, are actually based on reasons. And that's where you get the notion that it can go beyond the case at hand, because if the judgment exists because, let us say, a text means X, okay, now you've got the text means X, and that's for the next case, and the next case, and the next case, and, 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 and the next case as well. So I, I think that notion is, is, is baked into Article Three. In the front. Uh, thank you all for your compelling dialogue. Uh, my name is Nick Iacono. I'm a law clerk and a Georgetown Law graduate. I'd like to hone in on this issue of reliance. Um, it seems clear that for the stare decisis originalists, the issue of, of reliance is a paramount factor in the analysis, but this is 
sort of complicated by the fact that reliance is sort of a, a nebulous concept. Um, what manner or quantum of reliance is, is required? Um, is, is former Judge Lee of the Utah Supreme Court correct that only reliance that establishes rights of property, contract, financial affairs, only that, those types of precedents can have decision-altering force? Or perhaps is Justice uh, O'Connor correct that other precedents like Casey and Roe can engender sort of societal reliance. So I'm wondering if, if uh, the panel has any thoughts on how do we really define and apply this concept of reliance? Oh, sure. So uh, thanks for great question. So I think I would, I would take the two categories you mentioned and I would add one more. And so here's what I mean. You've got the the kind of targeted private reliance connected to investment back expectations, reliance of the sort around contract and property, say. Uh, and I think you have a pretty long established Supreme Court practice of treating that reliance as legitimate to consider, although I think it can be really hard to evaluate in lots of cases, but at least comparatively is something that the court is comfortable considering. I'd add a, a second category of reliance where the court's approach has been uneven. Uh, there's this sort of public reliance in the governmental sphere. So this idea that, well, the Supreme Court's edicts lead legislatures and other public officials to take actions, and those actions cost money and take resources and time. And there's a question whether that sort of reliance ought to be part of the judicial calculus. And I think if you look at the Supreme Court's case law, you'll actually find different answers to that, even in relatively recent cases. I tend to be one who thinks that sort of public reliance should matter. Uh, that if the Supreme Court is uh, revisiting decisions that are undermining legislative enactments, that's a relevant consideration. It doesn't mean that that protects the precedent necessarily, right? There still might be countervailing and overwhelming reasons to overrule, but I do think it's a legitimate part of the judicial calculus. The third category you mentioned, the kind of broader societal reliance interests, I think that's tougher. Uh, I think that's, uh, they're hard to define and they strike me as very hard for any court to specify with any sort of confidence level. To my mind, to the extent that there's a broader societal concern for stability, which I think there is, I think that's built into why there's a doctrine of stare decisis in the first place. I think that's why there's a presumption of deference to precedent in the first place. So I like to see that those sorts of broader societal considerations that connect to stability uh, more as general reasons that support a doctrine, not as something that an individual court should try to do in an individual case. That's my take, at least. Right. Yeah, I wonder whether uh, if societal expectations uh, and reliance were uh, legitimate consideration and precedent, would we have ever got overruled Plessy? Right. Well, can I just say, I think that, that also goes to the, at least, the, I think which is common between Randy and I, the, the common law nature of it, because uh, in considering what are the factors in the common law, we have to consider, and this is of course a theme of uh, Tara's remarks, judicial capacity. And I think it's really very difficult for judges to determine what societal reliance is. And so that's why I think that really isn't a plausible part of a common law doctrine of precedent. Okay, uh, the next question, uh, I'll, I'll take it at the back. Yes, sir. So, so, someone still there? My name is Anna Bergstrom. I'm a former law clerk to two federal courts who hopefully was not foolishly paid by Congress, as uh, Professor Lawson has jokingly suggested. My question has to do with perspective overruling in that theory. How would that functionally work with cases such as Griswold v. Connecticut and its penumbras and emanations, assuming the case was perspectively overruled? More concretely, would um, Griswold be limited to its facts or its legal framework eviscerated along with the relying cases that have been built upon it? Well, I think you're, uh, at least from your comment, you're talking about perspective of a ruling, but the, your, your um, discussion seems much more like cutting back to me. Uh, uh, so we, I propose two aspects. One is perspective of a ruling. I, I can say how that would work if we looked at uh, Griswold, we would say we overruled it uh, completely, uh, uh, root and branch, and, uh, but uh, we wouldn't overrule it in this case, and so it would be um, uh, say that the you know, next time uh, it would, uh, we, we, would, we would apply it 
Uh, I'm not sure how much difference that would make in that context. Um, I'm also not sure that that would be a, a wise decision. I have other precedent rules, including the uh, idea of entrenched precedent. Everyone sort of accepts uh, Griswold. I'm not quite sure that would be the best uh, idea for the court to go down that route, but that's how it would work. I think it would work in a simple way. Another way of thinking about uh, my suggestion about precedent is we would cut back on precedent. We would say, well, we're not going to uh, overrule actually this precedent according uh, that, that gives a right to contraception, but we're going to limit that precedent, uh, and we're not going to, for instance, um, uh, develop uh, some idea of uh, substantive due process uh, that uh, on which it uh, may depend. So we're going to cut it back in some way. Uh, that's another uh, possibility. Uh, and uh, those are two different kinds of ways of limiting uh, precedent. Again, I'm not quite sure how we would do it in each of those cases, but those are very different. One is a, a way of changing the rule only for the f future, and the other is not changing the rule for the, for the future, changing the rule also for the past, but cutting what the Supreme Court has done back to a place where it really isn't going to create many huge reliance costs, but it's going to be closer to the original meaning. Okay. Um, we're really out of time. Uh, I will take one last question from the front. Lightning round question. Quick one. Clark Forsyth, Americans United for Life. Stare decisis is really stare decisis equiete no mover, which means stand by the decisions and don't disturb what's settled. If settled precedent is the starting point, does that create a better analytical framework? Well, I mean, yeah, that goes to the question of whether what you mean by precedent is okay, here's one of the things in the stack of five decisions that the court just issued, or whether you're talking about, and I'll, I'll defer to, to John and, and Randy on this, whether you're talking about long-established lines of authority, drawing on custom tradition, natural reason, whatever it is that they drew upon. It's a very different conception of what it is that you mean by precedent. I mean, I think that's exactly right. Please join me in uh, showing your appreciation to this panel. <laughs>